First clinic specifically dedicated to providing traditional and holistic pain management solutions. He is a credentialed in pain management, holds an additional board certification in occupational and environmental medicine, and is a past president of the American Holistic Medical Association. So let's welcome Dr. Blattman here. Testing, one, two. Okay, great. Everybody here? Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, glad we had this talk after lunch. It wouldn't have been the same before lunch. But we come here to learn the truth about dentistry, and it's been fascinating and a wonderful education for me. And we're going to talk today about the truth about food and the toxicity of food, a little bit about where pain comes from in relationship to that. And we spend so much effort taking poisons out of people. I take mercury, lead, arsenic out of your body. You take it out of the teeth. Um, but our patients are putting a lot of toxic things into our body, and some of us might be doing it also. So what is the science behind the toxicity of food? And where is the evidence? And what do we really know? And what do we have to offer? We like to talk about how food choices affect inflammation and pain, review the science of food and inflammation, review toxicity of some common ingredients, and discuss the nutrition rules that complement treatment for pain. We treat in this room everybody's really difficult issues. Disabling, how many headaches a month, joint pain, dysfunction, the effects of fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, mold, and the toxicity in the mouth, and then rain pain. How many patients do we see that have rain pain? Or how many of us in the room can tell that the weather is going to change tomorrow because our body doesn't feel so well? What we've learned in our research is that virtually 100% of rain pain is the result of food-based toxicity in your body that comes to you because you ate something your body didn't want you to eat in the past six weeks. When you're clean for six weeks, and clean as your body really wants you to be, you'll go to the window and the weather will surprise you, which is really a joy, because then you can enjoy the rain and you can enjoy the snow. And how about patients, those of, any of you prescribe opiates? None? Okay. Well, I prescribe opiates. And there's a lot of misinformation about opiates. Like people who say my medicine only lasts two or three hours, or I take all my medicine by evening and have none to sleep, and I need more to handle this and handle that. And if you read the headlines, the U.S. has 4% of the world's population and uses more than 90% of the world's supply of hydrocodone. Why do you suppose that might be? Do you think it's because all of our patients are drug addicts? Do you think they're all fakers and don't really have pain? Do you think that the doctors are too free with the medication? Maybe all of that to some extent. But there's another theorem, and that is that the pilks in the USA have more pain than most anyone else in the world because our food supply is so much more inflammatory. And we need those medications in order to function and survive. And what you find is that when you take those foods out of the diet, the medications work a whole lot better. So the reason your Percocet only works for two or three hours is because you eat a food that pushes the Percocet off the mu receptors in your brain. And it can do that from one isolated incident for weeks. Medicine and surgery can only do so much. There's other reasons for pain and illness besides a medication deficiency. What if some foods actually overpower and make the medicines not work or make your post-op results not heal? Wouldn't it be awesome to show patients something they can do that changes their entire life? So how do we understand the toxicology of common food nutrition, pain, illness, and the rules for success? I have no conflicts of interest. So, the inflammatory process in our body, we are designed to have inflammation. We're designed to have inflammation for repair and for defense. If we have inflammation that causes us pain, 
from something that should have been repaired, then we have a repaired deficit, something that we've injured bigger than we can repair it, and our biology has switched to a defensive mode and makes us hurt. Inflammatory issues are part of rheumatoid arthritis, even osteoarthritis that we were taught was all wear and tear has an inflammatory component. All kinds of irritable bowel, Crohn's, skin diseases, fatigue, and chronic pain. How much of a difference can food make? Well, this slide on the right, on the left, I'm sorry. Every patient who comes into my office colors a pain diagram on every visit. Red for burning, yellow for numbness and tingling, green for cramping, blue for pain. And so you can see that this person has numbness and burning and pain and pain. And between the 6th of February and the 20th of February, these diagrams are radically different. And the major difference in therapy was a change in food. Also using a rubber ball and doing some massage, but a change in food. Here's another one. How much difference? A woman in her 40s, she's had pain since 2006, so this is 2013. And this is January, and this is February. And she's pain-free, and all she did was change her food and use a little rubber ball. Here's another person, woman with chronic pain and fibromyalgia and MS, less than a month, almost pain-free. From numbness, tingling, burning, I think I might have one more. May, April 15th, 2019 to April 30th, and all she did was change her food and use a rubber ball. What we learned when we had our, our workshop yesterday is most pain in the body comes from your fascia and comes from the nerve endings in between the strings of fascia that hold you together, that are kinked and injured where you've pulled them apart. And the inflammatory nature of the food and environmental toxicity doesn't necessarily make these wounds worse. It makes them light up like a Christmas tree. We spend half of our bandwidth ignoring ourselves. Just think of how much you have to ignore just to have this conversation, especially if your phone buzzes in your lap. The pain that you have is the part you can't ignore and the part that's in your face. So you don't need to be perfect. You need to be 99% ignorable. That's selective hearing. You don't want to select to listen to the things that hurt. Okay, so we get out of our body what we put into it, whether it's good, bad, detrimental, beneficial, and the idea of food being your medicine and medicine being your food has been around for a long time. So you can eat food that make your gut work and make your brain work, or you can treat your depression as a Prozac deficiency. Now, it's not that pure black and white, but I'd like to make the point. So we'll talk about the rules for nutrition, how nutrition underlies illness, underlies healing. Leaky gut, we hear a lot about food, and food is medicine. And pain is not just about food and not just about medicine. It's about getting healthier. Most of our patients in pain have multiple medical problems, and many of them have a common denominator. And we need to do what it takes to get this person's biology to heal itself. There's only so much we can do to help that along. The person and their body have to do a lot of the work. So what is the relationship between diet and pain? There's a mathematical formula that I wrote about years ago. It describes wellness and the concept of disease simply. <clears throat> G minus B plus R equals P. G stands for all the good things you can do for and put into your body. Subtract the number B that represents the bad things you can do to your body. Add a number R. That's the nebulous number of reserve. We, um, the number given at birth that we've used up with time. You add them up and you get P, the pain and problems you're going to experience. It's a pretty direct relationship. Well, people seek medical care because they're not happy with their pain and problem number. They go to church to negotiate for how much reserve is left in their body. And what we do in our practice with lifestyle modification is change the ratio of the good and the bad that what people do for themselves. And the more we can educate them in what the science is about that or the more we can set an example in our office and show them what to do, because you tell this to people and they'll turn around and go, well, what do you eat, Doc? What do you have for breakfast today? 
And first it's a challenge, till they realize that that challenge doesn't work. And then it's an education and a curiosity, like maybe if I just eat what you eat and follow your example, I'll be able to do this, because you obviously can do it. So theoretically, if we have enough reserve left in our body and we change enough of the good and the not so good, our body can heal itself. And otherwise, we go to the restaurant like the bear party of five and find out if we want to wait for a dumpster. Let's talk about the three rules. Rule number one, don't eat food that's fake. Really, how simple is that? Eat real food, don't eat fake food. So we're going to talk about NutraSweet, Splenda, Saccharin, and Margarine. Rule number two, don't eat inflammatory food. That's the stuff that sets off your immune system. Your immune system is intimately married to your nervous system and your fascia. The fibroblast makes inflammatory chemicals in response to an immune system hit. And those inflammatory chemicals make all the kinks in your fascia come alive to your brain. Rule number three, inside our intestine are billions of life forms we call flora. We need to learn how to grow and diversify the good guys and starve the bad guys. So let's talk about rule number one, the foods you never want to put into your body. NutraSweet, aspartame, sucralose, saccharin, you pronounce it, and margarine. So aspartame causes elevation in serum methanol, both in the man and in the rat. It is completely metabolized in the gut, absorbed as aspartate, phenylalanine, and methanol, and yet everybody thinks, or the literature says, it doesn't cause a health problem. Oral aspartame causes a rise in serum methanol, and dietary labeled aspartame results show formaldehyde-bound tissue in rats. And these studies have been repeated and validated. Aspartame is also related to hepatocellular carcinoma in a dose-related response. And men in this room and in our population and patients have an increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and multiple myeloma with more than one diet soda per day. It is a multi-potential carcinogenic agent at 20 milligrams per kilogram, which is less than the acceptable daily intake. Aspartame is 40% aspartic acid, 50% phenylalanine, 10% methanol, and you free methanol when you heat it and put it into your coffee. It's a cumulative poison with a slow rate of excretion. The EPA estimates that it's safe, quote, to eat 7.8 milligrams per day, and the average diet drink will make 15 to 36 milligrams per can. Methanol metabolism is interesting. It's mostly hepatic. You use alcohol dehydrogenase to oxidize methanol to formaldehyde, which is rapidly converted to formic acid in a folate-dependent pathway, gets oxidized to carbon dioxide. Ethanol will slow the metabolism and reduce the toxicity of aspartame, which means if you're going to drink a Diet Coke, you really should put rum in it. There's a toxicity from this formaldehyde and the methanol and the formic acid. The worsened depression in patients with mood disorders. It's neurotoxic to brain, causing damage and cancer, lowering the seizure threshold and causing pain, perhaps by inhibiting the glutamate binding to the NMDA receptor. Okay, so we're not going to use the blue package. How about the yellow package? Well, we make that one by chlorinating sugar. Well, we put chlorine into swimming pools to kill stuff. You put chlorine into your belly, you kill the flora we've been talking about or going to talk about in rule number three. You increase your fecal pH, you reduce your beneficial fecal microflora, and you change genetic expression. Oh, doc, I'm saddled with these genes. My family doesn't do well. Maybe I'm doomed. Did you all know 91% of your genetic structure is changeable by what you eat? When you recommend a vitamin, you're changing someone's genetic expression. You can change 91% of what your genes code for by what you eat and by the vitamins you take. 
you're only stuck with 9%, and you don't know what 9% that is. And when you do genetic tests, those are all modifiable also, or at least some of them are. Here's some literature. Splenda alters gut microflora and increases different glycoproteins and upregulates certain enzymes. You don't want necessarily to upregulate. How about saccharin? Orthosulfobenzoic acetamide. It alters gut microbiome, increases glucose intolerance, makes diabetes worse. That's a good reason why the dietitians recommend it. How about margarine? Where did that come from? Anybody watch South Park? Yeah? So everything bad in this country came from Canada or France. <laughs> in the late 1800s, Napoleon ran out of butter. You can't fight a war without butter, coffee, cigarettes, toast, bullets, and a girl. Every war movie has all six. Without butter, Napoleon was in trouble, because then toast is in trouble. So he held a contest to see who could replace butter. And a scientist bubbled hydrogen gas into, into vegetable oil and created margarine. It became important in the USA, food and the government, and they're still in bed together. And World War II, we ran out of butter, and margarine became an industry. And then it was discovered that insects wouldn't eat it, mold wouldn't grow on it, it wouldn't support or sustain any life form on this planet. So we put it into food and fed it to people. So that food would stay on the supermarket shelf longer without growing mold. Real fat goes rancid, exposed to light and exposed to heat. You hydrogenate it, you keep it forever. So I ask my patients, do you eat peanut butter? What kind you got? Skippy, Jif, Peter Pan, doesn't matter. Where do you keep it? In the cupboard. How many other foods do you keep in the cupboard that don't grow mold and don't spoil after you've opened them and you don't have to refrigerate them? And they think and they go, couldn't think of one. I go, so why doesn't the peanut butter grow mold? Oh, I don't know, deer in headlights. The answer is because there's poison in the peanut butter to keep the mold from growing. And if it won't grow mold, it won't grow you. And you can't afford to be eating something that won't help you grow new parts. Why do we eat? We eat for two reasons. One, to get fuel to burn, and the other to get raw materials to make new parts. So, what are you making your new parts out of? Are you making them out of something to be proud of that's going to last for a while? Or did you get them second rate um, by mail order? All right. Essential fatty acids decrease shelf life. So that vegetable oil that is on the shelf, we teach our patients to put it in the garage and use it for furniture polish. We cook with coconut oil, choice one. Olive oil, as long as you're not going to brown it too much, because that hurts it. And um, grapeseed oil. And there's some nut oils that work really well, too, with flash points at 400 degrees. So what happens when you eat this hydrogenated oil? Well, your cholesterol levels go up, your HDL decreases, your LDL increases, your prostaglandin balance changes, you get more acid secretion in your gut, you get more inflammation and blood vessel constriction, you have an increased incidence of diabetes, and if that wasn't enough, you just change the composition of every cell membrane in your body from your red blood cells to your brain. That's the most dangerous part if this wasn't enough. Saturated fatty acids activate cell skeletal muscles to release inflammatory mediators that trigger macrophages. That's in your fascia, and that's causing you pain. And pro-inflammatory cytokines induce genes in the dorsal root ganglion neurons and increase pain further. Now we get to cell membranes. Two layers of fat, a lipid bilayer with omega-6 and 3 fatty acids, triglycerides, phospholipids, and protein. And the job of the cell membrane is to bring stuff in and send bad stuff out. And then to remain flexible, because you've got to squeeze in all these teeny tiny arterioles. And what do our neurons have to do? Their cell membrane is critical for nerve transmission. If that nerve cell membrane isn't working right, do you think your nerve processes are going to work right? Or 
your ADD and all these sleep things and go on and on and on, and who knows? You're asking a nervous system to do a good job with a deficit in mechanics from something that you ate. So, the fats we eat are the materials we use to make membranes in every cell that gets made or repaired today. That means the french fry that you eat with the hydrogenated oil on the outside is going to incorporate that hydrogenated oil into every red blood cell you make today and you've just decreased your athletic performance for the life of that red blood cell which we all know is like three to four months. Plastic membranes don't transmit nutrients waste near as well. They lose their flexibility and the nerves don't transmit normally. And with years of eating hydrogenated oil, our body becomes like a genuine GM truck that's been fixed by plastic parts. How long does it take to get better? Well, it takes four months for the old red blood cells to die and the new ones to come in. Doesn't it make sense that you'll do better if you eat fish oil than if you eat partially hydrogenated stuff? So I teach my patients that one french fry increases their pain and decreases their athletic ability for four months. From this equation, omega-6 fatty acids go to less inflammatory leukotrienes and prostaglandins and omega-3s, um, sorry, omega-6s go to more inflammatory and omega-6s to less. And the idea of nutritional balance is to displace arachidonic acid from the membrane of the cell and change the balance of eicosanoid synthesis toward anti-inflammatory mediators and away from the pro-inflammatory mediators. So there's evidence for fish oil supplementation in many ways. And then I've also heard people tell me that if you take too much fish oil, now it's going to go rancid in your body because you can't handle it and you also need vegetable oils. So the vegetable oils are also important and the best equations for all is not agreed upon and is not known. But I will suggest this. If your fish oil smells bad, it is. If your fish oil has gone rancid, it has. And the only, and when the fish, the reason the, the oil doesn't go rancid in the fish is because they're all refrigerated in cold water. And they also have antioxidants floating through their system to keep their oil okay. And as soon as you take that fish out of the water and put him at room temperature, that oil's going rancid. So the people who do this best do that whole process in nitrogen gas. So it prevents any oxidation. So you want to ask your fish oil vendor, how do you make it? How do you harvest it? But there are benefits in rheumatoid arthritis. There are benefits for depression. More effective sometimes than even the drugs. A randomized looking at a trial looking at EPA and DHA more effective than placebo. And then you can measure all-cause mortality and show that blood EPA and DHA are related. And if you have them above the median, you have almost a third less risk of death from all causes. So I left you a copy of the abstract. And then we talk about vegetable oils. So evening primrose oil is a great place to get omega-6s, and so is barrage oil. And there are studies showing that with omega-6s, you can change rheumatoid arthritis, atopic eczema. You can decrease this arachidonic acid in the membrane. You can change prostaglandins. Really good stuff. The ideal dose is not known. Maybe one gram a day in a healthy adult with a good diet. Maybe three grams a day with cardiovascular disease. Maybe a lot more with rheumatoid and autoimmune disease. There's no good study to show us how much. So, you also might want to measure in people who you're using higher doses the effects of oxidation on membranes and make sure they're not oxidizing theirs. And then the drug companies came along with a way to prescribe fish oil and get it in the pharmacy. And they changed it from a triglyceride form to an ethyl ester form. Well, the ethyl ester is not necessarily your friend. And if you go to Costco now, you have to actually read the labels because they sell the ethyl ester over the counter now, too. You get faster and higher increase in RBC membranes with the triglyceride form. And this is interesting. How many people do you tell to stop their fish oil 
and stop their supplements before surgery because you're afraid they're going to bleed because it's going to make their blood thin. And there's no increase in bleeding even at three grams a day with aspirin and clopridogrel. Not even an increase in bleeding risk undergoing cabbage, carotid endarterectomy, and femoral artery catheterization. So I don't tell my patients to decrease their fish oil if they're only taking one or two a day. <clears throat> what fish oil should I buy? You need to read the label, and you need to know where the fish oil is coming from and whether it is esterified. But you can also look and see how much fish is in this fish oil. Well, the only numbers that mean fish are EPA and DHA. If you go to buy that in a discount store, you may find that the EPA plus DHA adds up to 300 milligrams of the 1,000 milligrams in the pill. That pill is 30% fish. You want to encourage your patients who are buying fish oil to make sure their pills are at least 50 to 70% fish. Because these ones that are 30% fish, the other 70% is genetically altered soybean oil. Not really your friend. All right, here, ethyl ester in the over-the-counter one. All right, so rule number one is no fake food. Fats we eat have a major effect on the health of cells, composition of our cell membranes, the development of inflammation and pain, and the development of chronic disease. <clears throat> rule number two, don't eat inflammatory food. So what is inflammatory food? Anything that our body sees that turns into sugar. Interestingly enough, caffeine turns into sugar too. It doesn't do it directly. It does it around in a circle. What happens with caffeine? It raises your cortisol, right? Because it increases your anxiety and stress. And what happens when you raise your cortisol? Your liver pumps out sugar, which is great if you're running from a tiger. But if you're sitting in class, and you're not really running from a tiger, then your pancreas puts out more insulin to handle the sugar that you just made from your liver that you put into your belly fat and in the inflammatory stuff in your body. Interesting, isn't it? We all want to feel like this nice Ferrari and this happy little bug, and our patients come in feeling like a horse-drawn carriage. <clears throat> the worst of the inflammatory foods are white sugar, white flour, white red potatoes, a medium-sized potato acts like a half cup of sugar in your body. And we think orange juice is good. We just had as much sugar as a can of Sprite. Next is wheat grain. Bread, pasta, cereal, crackers, cookies. So I have a patient couldn't figure out why she's not losing weight because she's really paying attention and reading all of her labels. And what do you have for lunch every day? Campbell's tomato soup. I said, well, let's look up the ingredients, not knowing what I was going to find. First ingredient, tomato puree. Maybe good stuff. Second ingredient, high fructose corn syrup. Third ingredient, wheat. Wow. You don't want to put that ever in your body for many reasons. So this isn't just for gluten-sensitive people, this thing about bread flour. People go, well, I had a test for gluten, and I'm OK. I don't do that test, because it doesn't matter. You still can't eat it. Why can't you eat it? Well, how many of you know about zonulin proteins? Not everybody. That's the one that convinced me. If you have something floating down your gut tube, and your body goes, I need a piece of that, and you don't have any active transport mechanism to bring that in, zonulin proteins that you secrete from your gut lining open up a gap in the membrane that shouldn't open, suck that thing in, and then it closes. So when you eat bread flour and gluten, not just bread flour, but gluten, you increase the zonulin proteins in your gut, in your lungs, and in your brain, and you open up the barriers you don't want to open in an indiscriminate manner, and that's our biology. So if you want to increase your intestinal permeability that you think is okay, that's what gluten is going to do for you. Soda is devastating to the human body with more than 10 teaspoons of sugar in a can. And the only way you can keep that much sugar in solution and not fall to the bottom of the can is to put phosphates in to help hold that chemistry. And in order to process the phosphates, you bleed calcium out of your bones. So if you want to change your osteopenia, 
you need to change what you eat, not just take vitamin D and not just calcium. One soda is more dangerous than one cigarette. Think about that. How many people do you know who live through 20 cigarettes a day, year in and year out? A little cough, a little sputter, but they're alive. 20 Mountain Dews a day for a week. And how many of you would survive without bleeding in your skin? You haven't slept in four days. Maybe the tachycardia would kill you. So one for one, maybe a soda is more dangerous than a cigarette. Teenage girls who drink soda have three to five times more risk of bone fractures than those who don't. Not a quantified study, but there are other studies that say the same thing. Sugar induces insulin secretion. Insulin is an inflammatory peptide. It increases inflammation all over your body. You want to keep your insulin levels low. It also causes insomnia. So I have a snack with some sugar at 9 p.m. I'm going to get a cortisol rush at 3 a.m. that wakes me up. And then I'm going to wake up at 7 o'clock tired without any cortisol to wake me up by and wonder why I don't have any get up and go. It also makes your opioid medications less effective. So my patient comes in and goes, well, I cut down from Mountain Dew six a day to three a day. Can I have another Percocet? Not really, because that three a day, you don't get partial credit. Why is my pain worse? If you wake up in pain that you didn't have last night, pain does not fall down from the sky. If you wake up in pain you didn't have last night and you don't remember getting hurt during the night, you ate something last night for dinner and your body sent you to your room. And your job is to go to your room and figure out what you did. Maybe it was increased stress, maybe it was too much physical activity, but it's most likely due to what you ate last night. If you go to bed tonight with pain you didn't have this morning, unless you did something to physically traumatize yourself, it was breakfast and lunch. And then I teach my patients to look at their tongue. What is the meaning of the tongue? Mirror, mirror, on the wall, these are the same tongue. The white is a reflection of how much yeast you grow in your belly from the sugar that you eat. And when you stop eating the sugar, you learn politics. If you don't feed them, your opposition dies. And as fast as they die, your food cravings go away, and you're a free man. That's the difference between that tongue. And there's no such thing as brown, hairy tongue. It's coffee-stained white tongue. Sugar, wheat, potato, and fruit juice. One teaspoon of sugar will set rheumatoid arthritis in a tailspin for a month. Wheat has changed. It's not the same bread flour that we grew up with. Not in any way, and Wonder Bread wasn't good then either. Hybridization, genetic engineering, those amber waves of grain are a foot and a half tall now. They have more gluten, healthy people get sick, sick people don't get better. And if you need to cook with flour, order your flour from Italy and overseas. It's healthier. But don't think it's totally healthy. They have celiac in Italy, too. And if you do have celiac in Italy, when we were there, I don't know if it's true today, you get $200 euros a month for gluten-free food. And if you want gluten-free pizza in Rome, you order it at the pharmacy. I was very surprised by that. So wheat consumption is linked to visceral fat, and visceral fat is an inflammatory factory producing the chemicals that destroy your body from the inside, from tumor necrosis factor to abnormal cytokines and so forth. And humulin, human zonulin regulates intestinal permeability and opens these tight junctions. They're released by gliadin, the primary component of gluten, also found in lungs and blood-brain barrier, and you can measure that now in yourselves and your patients. All right, why is potato on the list? Besides the fact that it represents starch in a boat, and a lot of sugar. It's full of glycoalkaloids that increase intestinal permeability, aggravate inflammatory bowel disease, and when you fry them, you concentrate the glycoalloids. Alkaloids and the prevalence of irritable bowel is highest in countries where fried potato consumption is also highest. So I teach my patients they really shouldn't have a teaspoon of a mashed potato. Oh my God, what are you gonna do instead? Can I suggest? Mashed cauliflower. 
My children had such a good time when their friends came over for dinner as they giggled and tried to stay dry, ask, watching their friends ask for seconds on the mashed potatoes, and knowing that it was really mashed cauliflower. And you, it's just the texture. If you get the texture right, it's really good. Rule number three is the rule of critters. Healthy flora make us vitamins that we need. We learned that in the last talk. And toxic flora take us apart, but they eat white flour, white sugar, and thrive behind the residue of red meat. Do we have a craving problem? How many people have food cravings? Mm -hmm. Let's think about that in a new way. Think about it as politics. Okay, we're just gonna talk body politics. So, when you choose your food, and you run your body like a democracy instead of a benevolent dictatorship, then all of your critters vote. And there's more of them than there is of you. And you go down the buffet line and you take all the things from the rabbit food line that you want and you get to the register and the critters in your belly go, oh, excuse me, dude, cheesecake. We want the cheese. Right now, go back and don't pay. Go get it. Right. That's food cravings, right? Well, the political lesson is if you don't feed them and they die, they stop voting and the cravings go away in about two weeks. So you encourage your body to run as a benevolent dictatorship and you decide who besides you in this body is going to eat today. What about leaky gut and dysbiosis? Symbiosis is when the critters inside help keep us alive, we work together, and dysbiosis is when they thrive at our expense. Normal gut bacteria synthesize vitamin K, various B vitamins, and panathenic acid, and riboflavin, and that was all in the last lecture. They also degrade metabolic toxins, prevent colonization of pathogens. They're the good guys. They run your body, and they run your immune system. They also run your brain. There's a direct connection between your gut and your brain that bypasses the blood-brain barrier. So dysbiosis is produced by conditions that encourage the growth of bad flora. So double-size your soda, eat more sugar, get some white flour, and then pound some steak down and let it sit there for a while. Because how many times a day are you supposed to use the restroom for a bowel movement? Anybody know? At least two. As many times a day as you eat. How about that? And I asked a GI guy, can you tell me what normal transit time is? He wouldn't tell me because he sees it all over the map. And he doesn't know what it should be anymore. He just knows what it's like because you can induce it with a drug that he can prescribe. We talked about that this morning too. So these toxins from these bad flora injure your immune system and injure your body. So here's the model of leaky gut. The uh, food goes in on the one side and the waste goes out at the end, and this tube is lined with intestinal mucosal cells that have a few functions. One, we all know, absorb food. Another one, they make immunoglobulin A. That's the frontline defense for our immune system. What happens if these cells are not online and we don't make enough immunoglobulin A? Then the white blood cells out in the suburbs need to pick up the slack. And what happens and how does that relate to chronic fatigue? If you divert the energy of your dilithium crystals to your shields, lad, you don't have enough juice left to run your warp drive. <laughs> if you divert your energy to your white blood cells, instead of all the systems that are on automatic, isn't that going to cause you some fatigue? And these intestinal cells also make 95% of the serotonin in your body. It's not made in your brain. If you don't fix your gut, Whatever you do with an SSRI has a limited lifespan. And then lastly, these cells make a barrier. And the purpose of that barrier is to keep poop, poison, toxic waste from leaking inside you to outside you. And if you take some zonulin proteins and you open up that barrier, that's what leaky gut is all about. And if you alternate between constipation and diarrhea, that's also what leaky gut is all about. How do you get this injury? NSAIDs, bad flora, too much sugar, zonulin proteins, radiation. 
and the intestinal mucosal cells are injured, the intestinal permeability barriers are broken, and now your gut becomes a super fun toxic waste dump site leaking into your body's water supply. That can't sound like a good idea, can it? And you sign up for that by eating the food, and you need to teach your patients how not to do that. And you need to also maybe lead by example. Can you measure it? Sure. A lactulose test will measure gut permeability if you need to convince somebody. What triggers it? Alcohol, NSAIDs, reactive oxygen metabolites produced by this inflammation, and also radiation and chemotherapy. And if you increase this permeability, you increase the hypersensitivity to food. So everybody running food sensitivity tests, you're wasting your money. If you're not already three months gluten-free and dairy-free, you're going to light up to way more things than you should ever light up to. And this endotoxicity is at the heart of rheumatoid disease, lupus, autoimmune disorders. It's all coming from here. In 1928, Arnold demonstrated bacterial translocation. That's the medical word for leaky gut. In 1931, Fisher demonstrated that yeast will go through that gut. In 1961, Sanders demonstrated that polystyrene will go through the gut. So the next time you order your coffee in a styrofoam cup, realize that you can measure polystyrene in your blood an hour or two later. And in 1968, Saunders, a surgeon at the time, tried to convince his residents that the yeast connection didn't exist. He drank a beaker of yeast and measured it, his blood levels um, when he was febrile, and his blood levels grew out candida. So diseases associated with altered intestinal permeability include Crohn's and chronic inflammatory joint disease and eczema and acne. If you have a joint that's in trouble and you're trying to recover cartilage, you've got to make this go away. It's not just about pain. Your bowel health is of primary importance. You need to improve your gut. And what about PPIs? How many of you are on a PPI? Not many, or at least we're all really quiet about it. But I bet you have friends that are on PPIs. And what's the effect of a PPI? A PPI is going to make it so you don't have acid in your belly. If you don't have acid in your belly, you don't absorb minerals. So now you're calcium deficient and osteopenic, magnesium deficient with more muscle spasm and high blood pressure. You don't absorb vitamin B12, and you don't digest protein, and you're malnourished. Does it sound like that drug needs an exit strategy? And there is. The exit strategy is L-glutamine, 500 milligrams four times a day, or a whole lot more, a scoop of the powder four times a day and before bed, and you will heal your gut and be able to taper the PPI, except with Barrett's esophagus. You grow a new gut every three days. Arginine's helpful, glutamine's helpful, omega-3 fatty acids and fish oil are helpful, and you'll get rid of a lot of symptoms that come from feeling toxic from all this food. L-glutamine is the preferential cell for the lining of your intestines from your mouth to your, not including, colon. The colon uses butyric acid as its fuel. And if you put L-glutamine into the gut, you can nurse the gut lining back to health. I already spoke about that. So here's the tapering. Every two weeks, you miss another level of dose of your PPI. So to help with your bowel health, you need to remove the toxins, replace digestive factors, re-inoculate with the good guys, and facilitate repair. And then comes water. Three quarters of you is water, and you need to drink a lot of it every day. And it doesn't count that you drink things that aren't water, because your body filters through that water, and your kidneys need that in order to detoxify you. And then what water are you going to drink? There's 700 synthetic organic compounds or more found in drinking water. Less than 10% are tested for safety. And how about chlorination byproducts? It's not just the chlorine in the swimming pool. It's what the chlorine does to what comes off the human that makes that pool even more toxic. So look up chlorination byproducts when you have a chance and their association between bladder and rectal cancer. And you're drinking purified water what do you do about your shower? 
If your shower has chlorine in it that you absorb through your lungs and through your skin, you can drink out of the water fountain all day long and you won't even get close to the amount of chlorine you absorbed in your shower. Isn't that interesting? And are you drinking out of plastic water bottles that put plastic in the water and as a xenobiotic increase your risk of breast cancer and prostate issues? And the EPA has known about plastic water since I went to an EPA lecture in 1987. Do they publicize that? Or do we sell more water in plastic? So when we spend years trying to run our high-performance Ferrari on bad oil and low-octane fuel, we wear out our reserve more quickly, which drives us to church more quickly. And we develop pain problems and illness that we shouldn't have. What is fibromyalgia? It's not a disease. It's a condition of being. Fibromyalgia happens because we take this high-performance biochemical Ferrari and we feed it poison oil and low-octane fuel. We let its gut leak toxic waste into its water supply. We wear out its core energy reserve and then we give it one more hit it can't recover from. And at that point, it doesn't matter what that hit is. It can be a psychosocial, emotional trauma. It can be a physical trauma. It doesn't really matter. It can be an Epstein-Barr virus infection. And all biologic systems start to decompensate. And when they decompensate far enough that you have enough symptoms across systems, we give you a label of fibromyalgia. Still not a disease. How do you get it? I just told you how you get it, and that teaches you how to make it go away. Restore the gut. Get rid of the fascia pain and the fascia inflammation, and you'll recover 70 to 90% of fibromyalgia most of the way as long as this person has enough reserve in their biology to heal. I've overheard fibromyalgia sufferers saying, I gave up my life because of this disease. I'm not giving up my food. But maybe it's the food that made their life what it is. And they need to change that food in a desperate way because their body can't do it without the energy that comes from the nutrition that they need. People say it's too much hassle to eat, right? It is. It's a lot of hassle. You go to a restaurant with me, I'm asking all kinds of questions from the wait staff. I make a deal with my lips. They don't let anything by that hasn't been verified by my ears hearing it's gluten and dairy free and verified by my eyeballs that it still looks okay. And if there's any question, my lips are designed to ask the question before they let anything by. And the brain is never allowed to say, hey, we know this guy, he's okay. Just let him go. Never. Because any time you do that, I could be spending the next three weeks in my room with back pain that cripples me and makes me not be able to pick anything up from the floor. So I would suggest it's too much of a hassle to have an ulcer, cancer, fibromyalgia, disease, and pain. Can you measure what's in an apple? Hmm. An ingredients list, isn't that pretty cool? Can you measure what's in broccoli? Probably not. How can this help me? You can help make your patient more responsible for getting better by what they eat. My patients know. They come in and they go, I've been miserable for a week and I know what I ate. Whereas 20 years ago it was, I'm miserable from what I did. Can I have an extra Percocet for two weeks? No. You need to go to your room and figure out what you did. <laughs> and when your body lets you out of your room, you're going to feel a whole lot better. And doesn't it suck to hurt? This is no longer a drug-friendly company, a drug-friendly country. It's not a drug-friendly state. So you don't get the liberal dosing of drugs. You need to make the drugs I'm willing to prescribe work better. And the only way you're going to do that is to help your body out of the mess that it's now in. And my job is to coach you and help you do that. Thank you very much. Do we have any? Do we have a minute for questions? Yes, absolutely. All right. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five whole minutes. Wow. If they can come up to ask. Yeah, that'd be great. Come on up and ask questions. Speak the mic, please. Okay, that works too. Well, first of all, thank you for the lecture. 
And um, the question is about dairy. So you say dairy free. What are your thoughts about raw milk or sheep milk or goat milk? Is it better than cow, I would assume? Or are you completely dairy free? And that's the end so of it. So your body won't teach you the lessons of 11th grade until you pass 10th grade. And so you won't learn about whether you can handle goat cheese and sheep cheese until you make the cow cheese go away and find out if you're as comfortable as you want to be. We use a, a tool in my house. It's a tool that has red balls that crush these muscles and put a lot of pressure on them. Because I know if I make this massage out first thing in the morning, my body moves a whole lot better through the day. And that would be so painful, I would dread it, but I would do it anyway, because it really made me feel better for the rest of the day. And like a switch overnight at three and a half weeks dairy free, it was no longer painful to do that exercise and the day before it was. And any time I touch milk or dairy again, it's painful and these muscles lock up. So I would submit a challenge to you. Get a good squeeze on your upper traps and if they're the least bit tender, take dairy out of your life for six weeks and find out if that changes. And if it doesn't change enough, it doesn't mean you go back to the dairy, it means you find out what's next on your list that you missed that you should have done before the dairy. But that's the way you find out. Your body has to tell you by how you feel. I think you can assume cow's milk isn't so good for you. But after you take it out and you feel better, because that's your test, then go ahead and have one of those other milks and find out, and please let us know. But I like being without pain, and I'm not gonna even try it. Two questions. Um, number one, what are your thoughts on four different blood types, four different diets? And second, your thoughts on this 12 to 16 hour fasting that everybody seems to want to kind of jump on that wagon. Okay, there's good reason to jump on that wagon. Your survival rates in cancer with that intermittent fasting, that intermittent fasting makes more difference than this food change, according to the studies that I've read. So I would suggest to do both. So the intermittent fasting gets some really high marks. The other question about the blood type I paid attention to that, I read the book, it was really interesting, but, and the thesis is awesome. But I also listened in the audience to a speaker diss the entire concept, and that made just as much sense to me. So the bottom line to the question, the way I see it, is that no diet works for everyone. Some people need meat, some people do better without meat. All right, so let your body tell you and feel the difference. But the do not eat list, is universal to our species. So start there, and then find out what your body happens to like best. And that probably makes more difference than what you can read in a book. However, having said that, when the person comes in and goes, you know, I'm really bored with my food choices. Isn't there anything else I can eat? Going to the blood type book is a good place to start to experiment, as long as what is suggested is not on this do not inflammatory eat list. My question's about glutamine, and I'm wondering, are there any cases where it's contraindicated? I seem to remember reading something about blood sugar balance and glutamine. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely correct. I have put one fragile diabetic in the hospital on L-glutamine. So unless you're a fragile diabetic, you can pretty much use this with impunity. And it doesn't seem to aggravate pain. It does seem to help the gut. Be very careful with the diabetics. Anybody? Oh, okay. I saw in a conference, if this is any help, a microphone that you could throw. <laughs> Honest to God, it's in a cube about this big, it's full of air, and instead of walking across, it goes by the same thing, and you just toss it to the person, it just floats around the room, and it was awesome. Anyway. So, Part of me, if I'm um, asking a question that you spoke about, because we got stuck with the vendor out there, missed part of your talk, but um, I'm very interested um, because my family of five has taken on a, a huge um, journey into health and wellness and really are passionate about nutrition. We've lost 325 pounds over the past year and a half. So I'm curious about exogenous ketones and if you have any, um, if you've done any research or what, what your belief yeah. is on the efficacy of that. 
The anti-aging community is in a lot of agreement with taking exogenous ketones and helping your body do that better. They're expensive, they don't necessarily taste good, but the health effects can be rather impressive, so I would not dissuade you from trying that out. When it comes to diet and losing weight, and why didn't my diet let me lose weight, maybe this will help an understanding. When we eat food, we have two hormone systems by which our body will choose to process that food, insulin and glucagon. If you stop pushing your insulin button totally, three days later, your body will start to run on glucagon and you burn fat and protein. And the first fat you burn is your cholesterol, which is one of the reasons you make it. And the second fat, maybe by close, is your belly fat. And you'll lose 10 to 15 pounds of that a month. And then, any time you push your insulin button again, you turn glucagon off for three days. So if you hit your insulin button twice a week, you're not going to lose a pound. And on the other hand, if you spend the entire month in a hospital bed using a bedpan and stuff yourself with little people food, and you're not allowed to eat any of the big people food that's on this, that's how people get to be big as they eat big people food, you will lose 15 to 30 pounds that month without any exercise just because your body will eat your belly fat if you weigh enough to lose that much. So isn't that interesting too? Yes? Yes. So zonulin proteins, when you have something floating down your gut tube and your biology needs a piece of that but doesn't have an active transport mechanism to bring it aboard, a zonulin protein is excreted which opens up a gap in that membrane and allows this to come through and then the gap closes. And when you eat these foods, you have more zonulin proteins indiscriminately doing that in your gut, lungs, and brain. So no matter whether you're gluten sensitive or not, you have an increase in zonulin proteins that's causing this reaction in your body. And that can't be a good idea. It's part of dementia. It's part of all inflammatory and cardiovascular disease. So it turns out if your patient does the best they can for self-preservation of just getting out of pain, they also avoid the inflammatory diseases that kill most of us in a bad, miserable way if we keep eating this food. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Blackman, for such a wonderful speech. We